last uh, lecture we did on the sixth about the ionic column. Um, so as Anastasia introduced me, I'm uh, an art history and artist, uh, a student of carving and things like this in London. And um, I've been teaching children and adults for quite a while. And with the last lesson, what we did was we had a close look at the ionic column, which is obviously something used in a lot of architecture. And this particular building features that column. So I thought it'd be good to go logically from a capital that we were drawing to something more substantial and mathematical as architecture tends to be. Um, why architecture? Well, I mean, I've been teaching a lot of drawing from the figure and lots of art history, copying paintings and different styles. And I was doing that for a while. And then I moved into this idea that uh, the organization of pictures in a way, like when you have many pictures, and you want to hang them all on the wall. Um, so the architecture is kind of organizing of lots and lots of things. And as you can see in the image, there are statues, there are bits of ornament, there are pottery, uh, figures in amongst columns, and, and all of this orchestrates together something a little bit more interesting than just individual bits. But obviously to draw it, you need to draw all the individual bits. Um, so in the first lecture, for those of you who haven't seen it, it was a free lecture last week. Uh, we started with this idea of the ionic column, uh, the second column after the Doric in the orders and something based on uh, two ram's horns or two spirals that come together into this kind of egg basket, if you like. Um, so those are just the tops of the columns, but then we're also looking at how columns originate. Where do they come from? Um, so here we've got a building in Turkey uh, and it's one of the classical libraries. Um, and actually, if you look at the columns, they all are parallel, but look at how many different things are happening in amongst them just because of uh, alternate numbers. So we've got uh, two registers of columns and then different hats and canopies in amongst them. Um, so I've got a quick presentation on PowerPoint and um, it's a building in Turkey today, but it was originally built by Romans who came into a world of ancient Greek and Trojan and Persian people. So it's a very long history and, and it's sort of the Romans adding something to it. Um, we all love public libraries and public libraries can be incredibly lavish and in different styles. And we're gonna have a look at a few of those. So um, what we're going to do is look at the map now. And um, you can see this is the coast of Turkey, um, very popular tourist resorts around Kushadasi up there and Samos in Greece. Um, so the place on the map in the middle is called Miletus. It's the site of a very ancient Greek theater. And of course, this is the uh, Lydian or Anatolian coast. Uh, but in this area, you can see it's very convenient for docking ships. So this was actually a major trade route and port and still is today. Um, just above there is the big city of Izmir which today, which is a multi-million uh, population. And um, a few years ago, as I traveled up the coast of Turkey, I was looking for these archeological sites. Um, now we're looking at a building that was actually built around 110 AD. So in our era, but in the style of the Ionic column in the Ionic cities, which were sort of, as Herodotus mentioned, 12 Ionic cities or Ionian cities. And then it was destroyed by fire. And it was built by somebody called Aquilus. Um, who was the, whose, whose father was a great general. So he wanted to dedicate with enormous sum of 25,000 denarii, uh, which at the time is something like 25 million, um, a great building to his great general father. So it would have featured, you know, equestrian figures around the sides and big staircases leading up to this formidable entrance. Uh, of course, this is not a entrance that is totally practical. And if anything, it reminds us of the Greek theater. If any of you have been to the globe, you might remember how theaters in the old days were many stories and people could pop out of anywhere from doorways and balconies and things could be happening simultaneously. And, and these divisions of space could work as theatrically different spaces at the same time, like a split screen today. Um, so I've just used Photoshop here to sketch in pink statues where they would have been originally. Um, Ephesus is a very interesting city. I visited the site and it had actually been uh, somewhere 
that had had about five cities. Um, this is a similar structure, almost the same. Uh, it's more known in Europe because it's in the Berlin Museum of Archaeology, in the Pergamon Museum. Um, and you can get the same sort of feeling here in Miletus, just down the road from there. Um, other buildings that come to mind are obviously this very popular series of caves carved out of the walls of, of rock faces in Jordan. So this attracts hundreds of tourists a year, except for obviously now, um, where people go into these caves. And, and of course, then there are caves that have been carved out in India and other places. So not always is it brick laying and stone masonry, but it can just be carving and drawing. Um, and again, um, grand entrances, to, in this case, just a cave. But in the other case here, this is the reconstruction on the computer uh, drawing of an enormous building that would have been painted in, in reds and gold. Um, the statues would have been shining. Um, you can see the equestrian statues of the generals either side, and then there's a big portrait of him in marble. Um, and then you can see there are four figures as well in these little niches on the lower register. Um, so um, as I say, it's, it's one of the three massive libraries in the ancient world. Uh, the other being obviously Alexandria in Egypt and Pergamum also down the road in Turkey. Um, also, it's mentioned the city Ephesus by many historians. So if you're interested in history, um, you can read about this city. Um, it was part of the Trojan War. There were Amazons living there. Um, the ancient city of Smyrna, it suggested it was this by Strabo, the Roman historian. Uh, Thucydides said it was the site of the ancient cult of Artemis, so the goddess of hunting. Um, and also, interestingly, this building was also not just a functional library, but we'll find out more about what people were doing there. Uh, this was a sort of brain of the city, if you like. Obviously, there's the temple and the cult of Artemis. Um, and then there's all this history of all these different civilizations rushing through, written down on an Egyptian technology, which is the papyrus. Um, obviously reeds stuck together. And I, I also visited Sicily where I actually saw this museum of papyrus. Um, and it's, it's a very ancient technology. And obviously, unfortunately, all of the scrolls burnt in the fire. Um, and then there were earthquakes in the mountains as well. Um, so these kind of computer models give us an idea, but obviously to draw it is something else because you can bring your own intelligent ideas to it. So this new city, the Roman city on top of the Greek, had been flooded so many times and rebuilt. And there was also a function for this building where they had underground tunnels going in and out. So men would go home to their wives and then in the morning they would go to study and work and have debates and go to theater at this building. And also they might go down the secret tunnel. And obviously, you know, that could lead to all sorts of things. Um, for example, it could be a courthouse where people could be condemned down the tunnel, or they might be visiting ladies from the tunnel in secret, or they might have secret business meetings. So all this kind of facade is, is just a facade for a lot of function in the city. Um, the four statues of the Amazonian women are representing different virtues. So we've got Sophia of wisdom, Arity of excellence, epistemia of knowledge, and anea of intelligence. So this is really sort of celebrating not only Roman leaders and cult leaders like this general, but also philosophy and the idea of discussion and debate. Um, great people have written about this. So Mark Twain in America was writing about this being sort of a, an ideal home, a library where you can live forever and never really need to leave. Um, and the secrets of knowledge were kept inside there. So we've got this kind of Greco-Persian uh, pot uh, and port of knowledge. Um, it's flooded and reflooded, and then the Lydian coast becomes this kind of place where people go on holiday. So even today, people go and visit the Roman baths of sulfur up in the mountains in Pamukkale, and there's the Roman cavalry, so lots of horses being raised for the Roman army and for games. Um, and as I say, it mimics a theater and you would have seen inside lots of different technology as well. So ceramics, glass, pottery, bronze, all of these ancient technologies at the forefront of global trade at the time, which of course means, you know, ships, um, shipping between ancient Greece and Egypt on their way down the coast and up again and sort of trading olives in one instance and then picking up gold in another from a mine and fake taking Egyptian papyrus up to this global economy, if you like. Um, and obviously the goddess of hunting, what a wonderful cult. 
uh, and this idea of these ancient Amazonian women, the women that cut off a breast and fired bows and sort of unable to be, uh, according to Herodotus, unable to be um, tamed and civilized in the Greek idea. Uh, so this, these statues in the corner are these Artemis goddesses, these statues that are found in the museum there up the road in Selchuk. Um, here are some close-ups of the statues and then in the top right corner is what's left of the library. Now this library was built um, again in the 1970s. In about 1978 some archaeologists reconstructed it from its ruins um, so we can only imagine what it could have been like. Um, when we're doing what we're doing here we can look at buildings like Sion House in London in the other corner which is a Robert Adam which is coloured in in purples and greens and and then Sion House again with this chequered floor you know we can just imagine the marbles and the, the decoration and maybe even mosaic there so um, these niches just above the statues they kind of protect the statues and they give us a sort of space to think so looking at other libraries how do other libraries look well this is over in Washington at the Capitol Library of Congress. And we've got these twin Corinthian columns, arches, Renaissance looking things, and a, and a very similar sort of straight facade there. So you can see how the Americans in the 19th century were taking straight from there and the columns in the Senate is like the same. Um, here in the USA, we've got the Pergamon Temple being mimicked by buildings like the Senate at the top, like the churches. And then we've got some portraits here so American leaders being carved out of marble in that tradition, portraits of them hung, um, and all these kind of perpendicular buildings like Philadelphia Town Hall and Philadelphia churches, all over the world, these things look ancient, but they're actually harking back. So American library is very, very much um, something to look at because incredible funds are being spent on them. And then back in England, I mean, this is the streets of Edinburgh. If you walk down Regent Street, you know, you've got these John Nash buildings that seem to often have rows of rectilinear windows. And then at the top of these windows, these kind of triangular in amongst semicircular pediments. So this idea then, you know, in Palladian architecture going across the board in all over the world. Um, Actually, when I was in London exhibiting a few years ago, I came across a similar story here with the Middlesex Sessions House in Clerkenwell. So a library that became a courthouse, somewhere where people were actually shipped away down a secret tunnel. So we've got the public toilet in the middle of the square opposite the schoolhouse, um, all connected by a series of underground tunnels. Uh, so people would have been sent to the gallows down these tunnels from the court or they would have been sent to a boat to Australia or to other colonies, um, very much like in, in Ephesus. This is a grand facade that also, you know, is quite uh, foreboding. Um, other buildings that I think are worth mentioning, this is the St. Petersburg Academy of Arts, the Sculpture Academy. The Stiglitz, Baron Stiglitz built this and inside there are casts now hanging of the Pergamon statues, all these kind of cast that you can see here from Cambridge. I've got pictures of, of the cast library. And then this Roman uh, building still features Greek um, lettering. So the Greek language never really died there because this is a second century. So, you know, people would have been going like very much like Emperor Nero on their grand tour of ancient Greece, learning Greek philosophy in Greek at the library. Um, so here are some sketches I did of uh, various statues, headless figures in museums like Athens and London, the British Museum, very quick sketches with just a few colors um, and just showing how, how it's quite, um, I would say it's quite charming to see, you know, disfigured things where you can imagine the rest of the story and, and ruins overgrown like that. Um, so here's a plan of the library and, and sort of drawings made on the internet of how it would have looked. So the papyrus were in these armaria in these uh, in between the columns these cases um, and then other buildings that come to mind the sort of Austrian museums like the Kunsthistorisches Museum all this sort of world knowledge collected by great collectors the Hermitage so we can only just imagine what kind of statues would have been in there what kind of materials like these lavish types of stone this, these yellow marbles lapis lazuli and you know, all these things so polychrome statues like this one of Zeus, uh, portraits of Alexander by Canova. Um, and obviously this has been part of my 
sort of project as a sketcher in various museums to go and, and sketch. Um, and then obviously the technology is, is quite amazing. Not only are they perfect at cutting stone very precisely and into these very thin anthemians and volutes, they can also make uh, mechanical things because this Antikythera uh, mechanism in the middle is sort of testifies to the idea that the Greeks may have had clockwork technology because this is sort of these buildings, how do archaeologists do it? Um, I've got a picture from York Cathedral where zinc plates are being used like pieces of paper to draw around the stones. So if they need to, they have a codex there and if they need to replace a certain um, stone, they're going to just use this zinc plate to stick it on the stone and then they can take the stone out of this building and put it back in. And obviously you can see in the mullions of the church window, that's very, very difficult because they're very specific and they have to fit. Um, so other museums and buildings around the world, well, you've got Philadelphia, Baltimore, all these collections in the world, which remind us of these grand facades. Um, libraries like that in Athens, for example, the Hadrian Library. So Emperor Hadrian is one of the great builders, if you like. Um, these are some sketches I did in Athens and the idea of Athens and the idea of this great school of Athens, um, something that goes into the Renaissance, this idea of the ideal city. So this is a painting by Raphael uh, or, or the circle of Raphael of these cities that feature ancient Roman doors, ancient Roman gateways into the city. Um, and just another couple of images. This is the library at Alexandria. So exactly the same structure is presumed to have been there only featuring green serpentine columns with those triangular pediments and semicircle uh, crescent pediments as well. Obviously the great city of Alexandria where Alexander the Great traveled through and probably died at um, after founding it, but later dying there, it burnt down. So we've got pictures of the lighthouse and the library burning. And then there's actually a modern library there, which um, was built in the 20th century. And, you know, you can see Egypt is building these new museums now. They've got great big projects and schemes for public libraries, public buildings with, with great facilities. So that's very encouraging that uh, the new museums are coming together. Um, so the last couple of images, this is a theater, but it's actually a Roman theater where the columns are missing, but you can see how simple the design is because you just got two registers of sort of stones coming out of the wall that would have been supported by these kind of columns. Um, so let's think about these columns. They're um, a set of parallel uh, ver vertical lines like a gro growing trees with a kind of umbrella over them. So roofing over these columns and then windows and doors in between them and spaces for statues. So um, how do we make a sketch of something like this? Um, we can just sort of start by getting a ruler or a straight edge, or if you want to think about freehand and um, we can sharpen our pencils um, to a, to a nice point like this. So something that you can see uh, very nicely if you, if you move away from yourself like this. So, so that's what we're going to be doing. Um, and I think um, that the other thing to say really about this is that um, yes, this, this library fell down. It, it's been studied by all these scholars um, but it's still very re relevant today. I mean, if you look at new buildings and new libraries coming up and, and how people want to use these spaces, and also it's relevant in conservation because so many buildings are, uh, you know, being restored. Uh, and so um, I was going to mention buildings that are being restored today in that style. We've got the Berlin uh, Schloss, the, the Berliner Schloss, the big castle that's being built right now in Berlin in this old classical style with the columns being made by robotic chisels and carving machines. Uh, so so it, it, it's not only the 19th century where people are looking at this stuff, it's actually still relevant today. And it is very abstract, even though if you recognize the geometry in it, 
I think it's still quite abstract. And if you wanted to build something out of different materials, you could still use the mathematics here. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind in a drawing like this is that it reminds me of a piano. It reminds me of the piano keys with the black notes and the white notes in between. So this idea of mathematical binary code, you know, the sort of sharp, soft, sharp, soft, very much like the eggs and darts we were looking at before. Um, so thank you very much. And let's uh, move on to the drawing part. Okay. Okay, so um, let's get started. Um, we have a lovely page in front of us. And the first thing I want to do is to take a straight edge and draw a bottom line. So that gives us the start of our pitch. And um, sorry to step in, I just want to make sure that everybody can see Philip's working station on a large screen now. Yeah. Uh, I can see that Shashi sent, ha, doesn't see. Okay, let's so uh, Zoom has made some uh, changes. So let's put you, uh, I can see it. Okay, Manuela can see it. Okay, so now. You should be on the big screen, but for some reason I don't see it. No, I can't. Paula Willem says, uh -huh, I see. Okay, let's figure it out. Just give me one second. How about now? Uh, Phil's um, hands all fine uh, now for me. Okay, now let's see it on the small screen. It should be on the big screen now. Please let me know if anybody cannot see on this small screen. Now I cannot see it. Oh dear Lord. Okay, let's figure it out. Yeah, I can see, sorry, I put um, a back. Uh, still not, still not. Okay, let's take a minute to put the workstation on the big screen. Do I need to do anything? Um, we're trying to, because I know that the Zoom... Um, Uh, Manuel says you need to press on the screen in the gallery view and then you can see it. Sorry for this. Um, I know that, well, I'm, I'm spotlighting it for everybody, but yeah. somehow it's not I'm seeing it but anymore, says Barbara. I was okay and now I cannot see the paper. Uh, uh, Phil, can I ask you to please sh stop sharing the recording and then we can uh, go back to the yeah. workstation. Sorry about this. Okay. Uh, you need to stop sharing the recording first. And Okay. 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 So we're uh, no. How are we doing? Okay. I think now we can see it fine. Thank you very much. Sorry about this. That's, that's all right. Okay. So we can see a little square page, and in there, I've drawn a bottom line. So that's just perpendicular lines and what we really need to do is try and find the middle so so we're just going to be measuring across from the corner 
to sort of find where we think we can have a middle line. And that's very, very important. So we're going to draw that in so that we end up with three vertical lines. And that'll let, let us plan this building out. Um, so the other thing to think about is there's going to be a series of columns. Now there's going to be 16 columns in total. So we're going to organize the space by just dividing up the height. So um, we want to create uh, kind of squares and squares again, if you like. So that will give us a nice grid to work in. And, and then we've got two registers already. Um, now, what are the proportions of the column? Well, this can depend on the height. So it's not a fixed proportion uh, in terms of its ratio. So really, we want to just presume that this register is going to be slightly less than a square and the next register as well. If we just take this measurement and mark it off there, we can get pretty much the same thing. And, and of course this is sketching, so we don't want to be super precise. We're sort of putting this together as a map. So within this, we now have to organize uh, four pairs of columns at the bottom and a space for the door in the middle and then three pairs of columns at the top in between them and that's very very nice because that means no rain is going to hit the bottom uh, of this building because it's blocked off all the way across but over two registers. Um, so how do we divide that? Well um, let's just find the middle by crossing it over very lightly like this. So this is our middle. Middle. And then we know that we can halve the space. So there we've got four sections. Um, also, we want to have a large door, but quite a narrow tall door. So by looking under here, I think the easiest thing to do is just to start with the door in the building. Nothing too complicated, but very central indeed, like a grand palazzo entrance. Um, in the case of the Jordan building, this is actually the door to a cave. In this case, it's the door to nowhere because the library's gone, but it would have been the main entrance and the only main entrance there. So after that, we want to create an even space for, for sort of two sets of, of, of uh, columns. And um, we can put in one column at the end just to start, and this will just be the thickness of about a centimeter in my case. And so we've got two out of eight there on either end. And just to jump up a level, I think it's good to straight away put in two more because they need to be absolutely in line with each other. And it's quite funny because these outer building, these outer vertical columns, they actually don't have a roof over them at all. They're just going to be free standing columns. And so that gives the illusion of something incredibly light for such a big monumental structure. Um, then we want to have um, another space. So if we just put a column in next to the door, on either side, 
with about the thickness of a column away from it, we end up with a position for two more and respectively on the next register up two more. Now we can straighten all these lines out later if we want. I mean, I'm just suggesting now like how to create the skeleton structure. So there is four columns and four, so that's eight already. And then um, another few columns uh, because obviously we need to have two more spaces. So we can just try and look. So the middle line would be a good place to put the edge of this one just outside the cross, just out off the middle, with the middle being the edge of that one. And again, working that up like this. And then we've got another pair. So if we look at that width there, and we just go across, we want to have just enough space really to have maybe the space of one column in between the gap because this is really fitting together quite a few things. And then again, up once again. So this is the 16 columns that are coming up in the building. So, so far, this is quite a simple idea. Um, it's an idea where everything is going up and we can just take a straight line and check that these parallels are working. But um, as I said, this is a building with actually alternating schemes of roofs. So that's the really attractive thing about it because at first glance you think, well, you know, everything is parallel, everything's going up. But then when you look closely, you realize that there are all these different in-between spaces, sort of knots of columns and, and roofs together. So that's a 30, 42 lines or something like that. So that's a lot of lines and it can be slightly confusing. And, and here's where the sort of next stage begins because now we're looking at how this fits together. You've got a series of hats in between the columns, all about at the level of the door or even actually above the door you can have these hats as the connections so so in these spaces we're going to have the capitals and then in these spaces we're going to have solid structures with gaps in between them So big, big stones, which give a sort of tympanum, a space for sculptural decoration we can put in later. And then on the other level, we miss one out and we miss one out here. So we start with the middle and in the middle, we're gonna have a hat in between this space. And this is a central sort of space of the whole building. And we're going to have a triangular pediment. So this sitting on top of a slightly lower, let's say, thing like this. So and then another block across here and across here. And here instead of the triangle, We've got this semicircular shape on top of it.
So that's quite interesting. And um, so, as I said at the beginning, we've got this uh, beautiful thing, this, this uh, doorway. So let's just make a nice frame for that doorway. So it won't fit too many people in. And then we've got the niches. So actually here, we're going to have arches. So just working slightly down from this box, we can use the top of this line, which is in line with the top of the door frame, to put in a semicircle. So, so that happens four times in here, in here, in here, and here. And so those spaces in between will have a little stand for each sculpture, if you like, just at the bottom, like a plant pot or a pedestal. So we've got these four ladies. Um, we can start with sort of a tall figure and then maybe putting in a head. Um, I mean, they're, they're actually draped in all sorts of drapery. So we can imagine lots of different lines. And, and if we just think of it as a stick man, sort of um, what leg is, is, is the weight going on? Are we gonna be able to move the, the head slightly tilted to the side? You know, we can be a little bit creative with these figures. And of course, you know, this is really, really like a stick man. Um, but the idea being that each pose can be a little bit different, a little bit expressive, you know, maybe a raised arm, uh, so the fourth statue, uh, intelligence, maybe, I don't know, she might have a hat on, uh, something like that. So those are the very, very tall, lovely four statues of figures there. And then on the next level, we, we could have um, either some statues again, uh, or we could have a combination. For example, there could be a kind of amphorae standing on top of there. So kind of egg, egg pot shapes with uh, maybe some handles on them, like a kind of champion's cup, uh, could be the base of, you know, a figure, things like that. So we can play, be playful with, with what we arrange, but we want to kind of keep a strict symmetry because the symmetry is, is key because obviously in these ancient buildings, even if the figures are different, they, they all fit into a symmetrical scheme. So, you know, again, pots could be there even without uh, statues. There could be pots with plants in them. But um, I know in this particular building, I think we'll just stick to the idea of four more statues. So already that's eight actors involved in this plot. Um, and then um, windows, another thing. Um, at the sort of level of their heads, if we just kind of draw a, an abstract line across, what we can try to do is have three windows. Um, they should be more or less the same size, so they should be quite narrow. So if let's put in something like this, um, so maybe about this width, And so not much thicker than a column really. And again, at the same height there, another window and another window just in between under these roofs. So, so this kind of number one of the big door grows upwards. So that's quite interesting because a lot of ancient buildings tend to show how there are actually more things on top of things than at the bottom. So they're trying to create this illusion of light sort of stone, you know, do the impossible and raise the stone into the air. So three windows, three, door, uh, three 
arches and then four statues at the bottom, a large door, which I can also shade in just to give us a bit of drama. And then um, more spaces here. So one of the things we can do is to just put in some kind of tooth looking shapes. Those are called dentils. So those are just kind of giving a little bit of a drama, sort of series of shell like shapes running along on the inside of really simple geometric shapes. So those frame little busts of various other people. So you could have a head and shoulders in there like that in each of these windows, if you like, looking at you. And of course that reminds us of buildings that we see everywhere with statues in niches and in different spaces occupying things and looking right at us and maybe often we don't notice them and you know Hampton Court Palace or anywhere else in London you can think of like the Foreign Office all these kind of gargoyles and buildings featuring these even you know beautiful women or bearded gods so that's happening up there um, now in terms of the columns the ionic column as I was saying uh, that's another thing we can do uh, is to try and come up with a sketchy way to feature these capitals. Um, so I'm just going to, on the last column, make a little space on the top of it so that it lines up with the other columns and then have a little ram's horn like that. So I'm not drawing too much detail. I'm just trying to keep it as simple as possible to have these capitals coming in. So as I was saying in the first lecture, these ram horns or volutes as they're called, they kind of represent the mathematical proportions of the Fibonacci numbers. And in them are also these cases of eggs that represent life. And then there are cases of arrows in between the eggs, which represent death. So it's a very philosophical column head. Um, so, so that's going across the eight columns like that. And then at the bottom, just beneath these four boxes, we can be putting in the ram's horns of life and death as a kind of figure of eight really, with, or like a figure of nine or something, just sketching those in. So they're a, they're a small detail and they get smaller and smaller in the spiral. And they work as a kind of um, detail that your eye can have a rest on and, and, and turn around. So as your line of sight travels up the building, if you focus on any of these, you'll just travel back round again. So this is a sort of snakes and ladders game of, of capitals coming up. And then other decoration. Well, if we take one of these boxes, um, we could just put in some nice straight lines across that sort of feature makes the horizontal thing again make the eye travel in a different direction in a perpendicular direction um, and the same on the top if we just divide that up into these parallel lines we can have you know that sense of horizontal coming into the vertical just breaking it up a little bit um, what else? Well, um, the other thing about these column heads at the top is they tend to get bigger. So we can just put in slight hats like that. And obviously the building fell down. So we don't know if there were more statues or pots on top of there. I mean, just for argument's sake, I mean, I could put in an amphora uh, which is a sort of representing the pot of economy, if you like, the Greek trade, you know, with all these olive jars going across the Mediterranean, featured on the top of there like that, uh, sort of from a thick to a thin shaft, and then, a, you know, a couple of 
nice handles on there just to sort of show just that all of this stone is supporting something very very fragile at the top um also just this top line of the square now i think what's also interesting in classical buildings is is that often have a kind of wider architrave or a, a wider astrolabe as they're called which is a kind of thing that that stops the rain and it gives the building a slight sense of being wider than it really is. And that's because this building is obviously seen from below. So if you're looking from the bottom up, um, as the building shrinks together, sort of like um, this in perspective, um, this top feature of being slightly wider at the top will give a little bit more width to it than it really has and that will actually make the building look taller and they got this idea from the acropolis so um in the acropolis the Ath uh, athenian parthenon also gets wider at the top so obviously these ancient people knew what they were doing and and of course if you look at the shafts of columns often you'll see that they also go from slightly thicker and chamfer in to the top so what we can do is just chamfer these columns by just scribbling in a little bit of thicker line at the tops of them. Oh, I missed one out there. So um, that sense of thinning towards the top actually makes the figure look taller than it really is. And, and also they did this with statues. So some of the statues that you think of like Giacometti's figures in the 20th century. They mimic these ancient Etruscan figures that are elongated on purpose and that gives a sort of sculptural tallness and, and makes, makes a sustained look of the viewer dwell slightly longer on these buildings. So I'm just suggesting with the pencil, while we're still here in pencil, just to try and give that sense of the columns not being totally straight but like trees uh, chamfering off towards the top. So I appreciate how rough this looks right now um, and that's why it's sort of called architectural sketching because if you were an architect coming up with an idea this is the kind of drawing that you could have to start with and then obviously as you go on you could have that drawn out very precisely with measuring equipment and compasses and all that kind of thing but um, for the intents and purposes of this I'm just going to now decorate a little bit more so one of the things we could do is just to plot a centimeter apart along the top some dots and so this is sort of a quick marking out of some ornament on the building so there we could have eggs in between those lines just to give a little bit more drama to the very top of the building we don't know if it had a roof it might have had a straight roof with just beams of wood going across. It might have had um, a gabled roof, which would be a triangular roof. Uh, but again, there's no real idea. And looking at other buildings the Romans made, they invented the basilica, so the cross-shaped cruciform building. Um, so obviously they knew how to put a piece of wood across that would be big enough to span the widths of some of these buildings. And they actually designed these buildings with that in consideration. Uh, the other thing, the ornaments we could put in here, I suggest just really simple voluted lines like this, sort of figures of S curves, um, sort of uh, giving us a, a little bit of symmetrical, you know, voluted ideas or scroll ideas, because of course, one of the things in the building are these scrolls of papyrus. So it might be accidental, it might not. This might be 
the sort of signify of what the building is for, which is to unroll these wonderful scrolls of knowledge. Um, so if you're happy with your sketch, um, we can start thinking about how to color this in. Um, obviously the building is pretty flat right now. Um, so it's, it's viewed straight ahead, straight on. And really what we want to do is give it that context, just put it up against a beautiful blue sky. So um, I think the best thing to do would be to take a rather wide and flat brush when you're ready. And with something wide and flat like this, we can just wet the paper. And as you can see, what happens with this graphite in, in water is quite nice because we can just smudge the inky graphite across just to get away from that white of the paper. As I we was saying in the last lesson, the paper already contains this titanium pigment. So it's already bright white on the paper. So just having an off white is a nice way of, of getting your architectural sketch to look a little bit more uh, 3D. And the other thing I'd like to do is just to suggest maybe a little staircase at the bottom. So just bringing across some steps just to give it an even more grandiose approach. So, um, so having had a little bit of water on, I think we'll take something like a Prussian blue or a cobalt blue, any kind of blue that you like, and just set the building off against the day light in this Mediterranean colorful sky. So hopefully you're all kind of getting to the colouring stage. And it's a very simple colouring in. Um, if we want the building to look in context, what we can do is also think about the bottom of the picture. So if we've got um, just the edge of the building, uh, we could take a slightly sharper brush and suggest a few cypress trees. So, you know, this is the kind of trees that grow in the Mediterranean. We could have a few triangular cypress trees just put together on the wet on wet. So this is supposed to be blurred and far away in the background. And um, you, know, you could have just with one brush mark and a few different heights, and you could suggest a Mediterranean landscape. Um, also, you could have a little bit more green. You could stipple the brush, you know, just create a sort of vegetative state, a vegetative background. And different shades of green is always good. But, um, you know, we don't want to stay too long on this. So you just got a little bit of green either side of the building against the blue sky. And then um, this is all sort of transparent paintwork, by the way. We're, we're looking for something that looks very, very light and easy to, to do. Um, and the other thing we want to do is just give the whole building a color. So um, in my sketch, I gave it a slightly yellowy color because that, will, that just depends on the kind of stone it could be built of. Because if um, we look at the colors that they had in ancient painting, a lot of them were derived from colors like ochre and red earth because they're sort of the primary color palette of um, 
the ancient paints because they, they're natural rusts. So before having too many bright colors, uh, materials would have had simple um, colors of the earth really. So here's our just brushing on a light sketchy base color, if you like, on the building. You can kind of cross over these thick carbon lines and you know we can always take off with a cloth as well if, if it feels too thick or just use the brush to move the paint across the pencil and actually use the pencil as part of this sketch because then we get these lovely shadows uh, forming as well. But keep the brush watered and cleaned so that we can have lovely clean amounts of pigment just in sort of simple movements across without too much stopping. Um, and I, if, if anything starts bleeding, that's fine as well. So there is our set of steps and columns just filled in. And um, then we've got the spaces in between. So um, let's have a look. Can we also fill in with a bit of paint in between? So actually everything slowly becoming monochrome, monochrome. It almost just water is enough because one of the things we want to do is to focus the color in the bits that stick out most. So um, that's why I've now got a bottle of white paint. And what I'd like to do is just, um, start to work in a little bit of white on the surface. Um, this is kind of, it could be gouache, it could be any watercolor white, any bright white basically that you can think of. And in this case, I think if we get a smaller brush, that's better because then we can use the tip of a smaller brush to play with as we put in highlights. Now for highlights, we need to just decide where the brightest part of the picture is. And it might be as with the column from the right to the left. For example, if I put my sun in, like as an indicator, there's my sun uh, shining down in these directions. So where would the light hit? Well, um, obviously the top line we can just sketch in like that. One of the things often artists do is they get um, another brush and they just use it as a mild stick. So just to run the brush along the stick is quite nice because it just gives you a straighter line edge if you're, if you're not feeling too steady. I mean, so there's lots and lots of light on the roof like that. And then other horizontals, well, we've got this horizontal here. We've got another one on the other end. Uh, where else? On the top of these boxes, we can run a bit of light across there. So there's the light on the shelves of the bookshelves, if you like, or the book cases. Um, then there's going to be some light on top of these structures here on the frames of this building. And then on the statues. So the statues is where actually the light will hit most because they're actually freestanding, these four statues at the top. Um, there's nothing over the top of them. So we can just like Canaletto, 
put in a few simple brush strokes along their drapery. And just by doing that, that's enough to suggest quite a lot of movement and quite a lot of 3D effect without actually painting in anything in too much detail. I mean, I just love it when I see a guardi and it's literally a few blobs of paint that are working so effectively in the right place. Um, down below, the statues also, again, catching some light, but perhaps just a little bit less because they are inside spaces, cavernous spaces inside the niches. So that's the drama that the ladies with all the secret knowledge in the building are slightly hidden underneath the arches. Whereas these people at the top are right in full view. Um, also on the steps, if we start to think about the light hitting each step and just create three sets of steps across and just continue that line over. Just trying to keep a steady hand. So there's a little bit of lighting from the top down onto the building. So this white is quite opaque, but it's really mixing quite nicely also with what's there on the wet paper. So that can give us a little bit more uh, drama. And then the columns. Um, now that's where the real drama starts because obviously if they're side lit from one side and this, you know, this is happening all day long that the light is changing. So if we have a thicker bit of light at the bottom of each column and then chamfer off towards the top, then we get these kind of obelisk shapes going up. And that's what makes them stand out so much. So here we are, eight columns side lit appearing out of this mathematical system. So that's where the building starts to come alive. And um, obviously in the middle space, there might be a little bit of light on some of the carved wall, or, you know, it might be brick wall, might be stone sort of brick wall, where it might be that there are carved statues and vignettes inside. So we can just play with the brush on these flat surfaces and just create some agitated brush marks that could suggest something more, you know, some more features. Like these eggs, we can just put in dots in each egg on the right side of it. Just to give that running band of egg and dart ornament also a bit of life. And also these amphorae, if you remember at the, at the top, um, we can just put some side lighting on them and um, just to have them also coming alive, mainly from one side. So that can be quite nice just to have that also at the top. Um, then these boxes, I just suggest, because we put those lines in, we might as well push them forward on out of this darkness and have them having a bit of oomph at the front. Um, 
then even in between these you know these little scrolls as i was saying the tip of the brush which is just draw them in and again this doesn't have to be very precise it's just it's not precise at all it's just the movement on the surface being spirally so highlighting things like that can obviously set the sort of front of the things nearest to us off the background and then with the white things like door frames could just also become more noticeable you know we could have small flicking of the brush there you know suggesting a frieze or some kind of entablature other other kind of things like these figures in the top just coming out of these little dentils, these little things that we were drawing in before with pencil. Again, just highlighting those in. So that kind of gives you a map of the building um, in light and shadow. And then another thing, the drama of shadow. So let's just think, how can we get shadows in? You know, how can we make these buildings look like they've got some cast shadow because at the moment we've got proper shadow in just the dark lines that represent the grooves in between things but if we get another brush now uh even a thinner one and think about mediterranean light and shadow we could take a dark blue um we could get that to represent the cold shadow because if, if we have a warm light like this, then it's kind of natural for, it, for there to be a cold shadow. And, um, you know, that could be a cast line even across like this, just under the hat of this building, just showing that the space behind it is, is dark. And as you draw buildings in real life, what happens is the shadows keep moving. So it's really a matter of being quite free and just catching a certain angle on those. So dark shadows there underneath the roofs in a diagonal line are going to set the building off a bit. And then also we've got these arches. So again, in the arches, if we just put in a shadow like this, just behind the statues. That's gonna give a bit of drama to those arched spaces because those, those arched spaces are, again, edges where the light can't get to. And, um, what other shadows can we think of? Well, maybe the door, we could have a dark green door because that could be a bronze door. So when copper oxidizes, you get the verdigris color. And as we're mixing that with the black of the pencil underneath, we're getting this kind of very dark bronze door. If we want to put a little bit of highlight on there, you know, we could put in tiny little marks denoting maybe you know little spaces within the door frame just to make that feel like a door but you know they don't want to dominate so if if, if anything they just want to be suggested um and so there's a little bit of light and shadow there uh, i think we can probably get a get away with some shadow inside these pediments in between the dentils again, just behind the statue's shoulders. You know, that, that makes it again quite dramatic. And uh, even little marks in the ornament in between the white dots, you know, that, that can look like a canaletto figure, uh, just even though it's 
just black and white dots, if we can read that because we know what we're going to translate in our brain, we can read that as something much more complicated than it really is in the painting. And I think that's the great challenge of great painting is that if you look at some of the great paintings, they're not overly described. And it's the mind that does the rest for you, just like with the ruined sculptures. So let's just put that in. And the other thing too is I, I suggest maybe we'll get a little bit of dark sort of wine colored red, a rusty color, and just go around the capitals edges and just get those columns to come off the surface like this. So just by putting in the red half tone, that's quite nice because that works against the blue light. And this is a kind of warm shadow now. Uh, so there's been a long dialogue in the history of painting between people that thought, you know, sort of warm light and cold shadows. And then other people in the sort of later painting with cold light and warm shadows. So here I'm suggesting using both reds and blues for shadows, really just to make color work well, in a complementary way, you know, one color work against another. Oh, I just realized there's a bit of light missing. So um, if we have a cold cast shadow and a warm proper shadow, as in the shadow belonging to the column, then that makes the building even more contrasting. And um, if you want to use this to mark in a few other edges of things that you might want, and again, with mixing it with white, you can have kind of gray, red, um, warm light on some of these features that stick out. So we've got these three hats like the piano keys, three sharp notes and then four flat piano key things here. So there's a sort of pink light on those. Um, and also the capitals, I keep coming back to the capitals because this is again, very, very small things that we can literally, if we draw a dot and a line in can be suggesting these elaborate carvings. So that is just the kind of details that make us recognize the Ionic order there as a repetitive order. And, and this is funny that they repeat exactly in the same place, but it's what's happening in between the columns that uh, gives us the illusion that they're not the same but they certainly are. So this is a very enigmatic building. It draws you in and as you look more and more at it, and of course this has been imitated, as I said, in the other big libraries like Alexandria, like ones in Athens and, and in modern buildings like in the American libraries, these classical theatrical spaces draw you in. And the more you look, the more knowledge you get from these statues, the more drama can happen and, and the more seemingly sy symmetrical things can actually be not symmetrical. So later on in other lectures, I'd like to show you Rococo buildings and you know how these stylistic things were borrowed and how they changed in different periods of architecture. Um, but really, I think that's kind of what I was going for with this session is just to introduce you to the idea of not only planning something out, but 
using light and shadow in there, um, using a bit of color and great. Yeah, I can see people have actually printed this image off. That's great because, you know, you can keep working into this. Um, you can actually take a pencil and use a pencil to redraw. Um, so if you want to enhance some of the shadows on things, you can actually draw again. So we can actually surround little details. Uh, we can put in other little marks where we see fit. And then we can actually more, be more specific and, and, and emphasize with the outline what's kind of been lost in the paintwork. And there's nothing wrong with using an oily pencil to do that or use the pencil again to, to go around things or a brush, you know, or you, or you can do this with a brush and draw in the volutes as much detail as you like. But what I would warn against is doing too much detail because this is a sketch. So really it's, it's kind of knowing how to say the maximum amount of things with the fewest actions in a sketching sketching mode and of course you know now we've got computers we can copy paste exact things in but it's only through drawing them that we can really understand not only the craftsmanship that went in but uh how to suggest things you know how to play with shadows and light as a designer and that's a totally I think it's a totally manual, you know, hand-eye work. Um, we can brighten things up. We can add light where we think it could be reflecting. We can also go back to the original ochre color and just work that over, mixing it with the white because that's a nice way to get a nice bright tone in here because everything's got quite muddy. So I think now just sprucing up the building by mixing ochre and white and thinking about where the light is going to be brightest um, and just brightening up some of the furrows in between. That can be another thing we can come back to, how to work in more detail. But I think um, the figures themselves, again, um, just outlining them again could be quite a good thing to do because now they can stand out as separate entities. And again, like as we looked in the designs done on the computer by archeologists, these statues might have been marble. They might have been painted. So we don't know what the color scheme is and you know what the archeologists suggested in the Alexandria is that some of the columns may, may have not been the same color. You know, you could have another thing where you get green marble used. Uh, so, you know, just because the archeologists put together something out of the rubble doesn't go to say that the Romans didn't feature, and of course they probably did, different colored stones. Um, so I'm, you know, what, what I'm doing now is just changing the color of the stones um, and suggesting that some of them might have been green. So if you look at things like the St. Mark's Basilica, um, what happens is, some of the columns there, the pilasters there, are actually a mosaic of stolen porphyry or, you know, other colors like blue could be used. So, you know, this could actually get quite like an Indian building 
um, or like Wells Cathedral, which was originally a Gothic cathedral that was painted and, you know, quite shocking to a lot of people because we, we're used to Gothic abbeys as being the colour of stone. But I mean, that's the fun of this architecture that, you know, you can change the lighting either with projections, um, you know, like they do the 3D mapping and change the colour with light or they can change the colour by just having originally different coloured stone featured in there. So it can get quite exciting. And I think I'll, I'll leave it open for you to decide whether you want all the same columns or you want different coloured columns. I've suggested doing, you know, a little bit more, a little bit more varied colours there. Um, but it's up to you entirely what you do with your library and what books will go in. So I think that's sort of coming to the end of the lesson. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it and could keep up. And I don't know if I can get any questions. Um, but um, I can certainly unmute people if they want. I think I can unmute people. Um, let me just see. If anyone has any questions, um, we're going to play this back to you. So there'll be a recording available for a few weeks, or I think for a week at least, where you can watch this again um, and you know write any comments and, and um, I'm happy to answer any other questions about this. Uh, Dior, just to remind you, there is a chat if you have a question uh, for Philip. Uh, otherwise, we'll be able to pick up your questions in email if you come up with a different uh, well, a question later on. And we look forward um, to uh, seeing your works either in Facebook group or in Instagram, where Art Enthusiasts London. Philip, thank you very much. It has been a fascinating talk and practice. I really enjoyed it. I hope everybody enjoyed it as well. And uh, the next part is going to be on the 3rd of January. We're moving to Rome, to Renaissance time, and to some Basilica. Oh, sorry, some Peter's. Some Basilica. Peter's, yes. So we're going to see how this architecture elaborated and moved on. And, and it, I was just looking at this earlier. And if you look at the front of St. Paul's Cathedral, I think you might notice this is very similar. So that's what we're going to look at next time. Okay, I think we have come to the end of the session. We're looking forward to see your works. Philip, thank you very much once again. And we're just going to wave you goodbye from uh, this lovely facade. Of it's a great Oklahoma. pleasure. Thank you very much, all of you, and see you soon on the 3rd. Thank you very much. See you in a bit. Bye. Bye. -bye.